Should Tucson raise its sales tax? It's up to voters. We don't believe in tax and spend, and this is a tax and spend issue. It seems like it's definitely the right thing to do. And what will it cost? People might not want to go to a lot of the retail goods within the city limits. You might find yourself going to the, the uh, Marana Outlet Mall. Plus, ensuring election integrity and a peek at the renovation of one of downtown Tucson's most iconic buildings. This is Metro Week. Hi, I'm Andrea Kelly. Thanks for joining us. Today, we're exploring the decision Tucson voters have in front of them, whether to raise the sales tax. Ballots are in the hands of voters, and the election's outcome could affect all who shop in Tucson. More on that after a look at the week's top stories from the Arizona Public Media Newsroom. The sawmill fire has burned about 50,000 acres north of Sonoida. Hundreds of people are working on the fire, including air and ground crews. They continue to make progress on putting the fire out. Highway 83 is now open after the fire caused its closure for three days this week. Officials say firefighters spent much of Friday building a fire line along the eastern side. Fire investigators say it appears the fire was started Sunday by an off-duty Border Patrol officer who was target shooting east of Green Valley. Pima County Administrator Chuck Huckleberry wants to hold the line on property tax rates for the coming fiscal year. He sent his budget recommendation to the Board of Supervisors Wednesday. Nevertheless, many property owners will likely pay more in taxes because their assessed property value has grown. The property tax is the county's main source of revenue and it will support a budget proposal of one and a quarter billion dollars for the fiscal year that starts in July. Pima County lost voters in the latest count of active voters, but the county had some hotspots of new registrations. The voting precinct with the largest number of new registrants since the beginning of the year is in Marana. The precinct is on the northeast side of the town and had more than 130 new voters register. More than half signed up as independents or no party. We'll have more on voter registration coming up later on this show. For more on all of the week's top stories, you can always visit our website, news.azpm.org. Voting in the Tucson sales tax election is entirely by mail, and ballots have been sent. We begin our coverage with an overview of the sales tax question at stake and a look at the economic impact of the voters' choices. Raise the sales tax or keep it the same. The city is asking for a half cent sales tax increase. Um, it would raise over $250 million over a five year span. Now that would go to the Tucson Police Department, the Tucson Fire Department, and Tucson Roads as well. So how would it be divided up amongst those three agencies? So for the road repair project, $100 million would go towards the arterial streets, so major streets within Tucson, and uh, residential streets, 60% being the major streets and 40% being uh, the residential streets within those areas. And those are streets that are in the worst condition. Yeah, that need to be repaired, restored, and um, resurfaced as well. So then for police and fire, how's that money planned to be so spent? So police and fire, they'll have $150 million. Now split between both departments, these are for things like vehicles, of course, uh, safety equipment, um, and infrastructure needs. All right, so 65% of the current police vehicles are out of date and need to be replaced. About 90% of the uh, ambulances within the fire department uh, need to be repaired and replaced as well. So these are things that are critical needs and that these capital funds will, will help them uh, get towards, uh, as well as infrastructure needs. The fire department wants to rebuild uh, five fire stations, and the police department plans on putting up two new substations, one on the um, southeast side and one on the south side of Tucson as well. How can voters be sure that if they're considering voting yes on this, that that's actually how the money would be spent? or if, they, if they're not quite trusting of what the city's gonna do with it. The city has put forth uh, a whole map outlining, of course, all of the major streets um, and where um, they can see that those repairs are gonna take place. And same thing for all of the police and fire equipment. Um, these are a list of every single expenditure that they plan to put forth with all these funds, um, you know, towards bulletproof vests, towards the computers and monitors that go inside the vehicles, to even the vehicles themselves, that you can see the exact dollar amount that'll be used on those uh, needs. Where can they get that information if they're not sure? Though that's all on the city website. And so yeah, they can find that. And when they get the voters get the pamphlet in the mail, it'll have all that outlined and where they can find it online as well. Now, I think it's important to note that um, this would be a city sales tax. So if somebody lives in the county and they drive into Tucson Mall, for example, or Park Mall, um, they would then be paying the tax. So how, what does the city say about how much it would cost people? Yeah, so I mean, the sales tax sits at 2% right now. 
Uh, if this passes, it would go to 2.5%. And like you said, anybody coming in from outside the Tucson city limits would be affected as well. Um, the prices would go up with the retail goods. Now, for every Tucson in here in Arizona, that would be around and cost them around $3 more per month is what is estimated by the city officials. Um, so yes, it will affect the Tucson residents as well as people coming in from outside the city as well. Now, you talked to an economist for some reporting on our NPR station. Um, what did they say about sort of what the passage could do for the economy, what the, what the economic impact of it would mean? Like I mentioned with the increase in the sales tax, if it passes, uh, people might not want to go to a lot of the retail goods within the city limits. You might find yourself going to the, the uh, Marana Outlet malls that are just right outside because you'd, paying, you'd be paying that much uh, less. Same thing with buying a car. Um, you know, it's very expensive to buy a car in the first place. And with an increase like this, buying one inside the Tucson city limits uh, would make it that much more expensive as well. What's the flip side? What, is, what are the economics of not doing this? Well, the economics of not doing this, of course, is you wouldn't have to worry about another tax increase. Um, and, but for the, for the Tucson Police Department and the Fire Department, th that would be huge for them if this, if this didn't go through. This is something they're depending on. This is something they need, uh, something that within their budget they can't pay for, within the, the uh, city budget they can't pay for. So they've really tried to look around to see how they can get this money, and they believe that with this proposition, um, something like this could, could work out for them. So there's sort of no firm official plan B if it fails for those departments? They've looked around. There's no official, I guess you could say, way of going about how they're going to get those funds later on. Um, but let's just say that they're really hoping that something like this works out for them in the end. Now that we've covered the nuts and bolts, let's get a feel for the politics. Local Democratic Party leadership supports the increase, and the Republican Party opposes it. I asked their chairpersons to explain. The Pima County Democratic Party supports Proposition 101 largely because our police and our firefighters are asking for that. Uh, the Tucson Metro Chamber, the uh, Visit Tucson the Tourism Office supports it. It seems like it's definitely the right thing to do for Tucson. We wanted to vote yes for Tucson. The uh, Pima County Republican Party opposes the sales tax increase, uh, largely on principle in that we feel it's a budgetary issue. Uh, we support police and fire and roads, uh, but we believe that uh, these are essential services of the city and they should be taken care of in the budget first. Uh, and not uh, put on the back burner and then go to the taxpayers for a, a sales tax increase to fund. And Joe, voters also approved a temporary um, road spending plan in 2012 that's set to expire this year. That was approved by a narrow margin. And I just want to ask, why continue with the temporary measures? That was a five-year plan. This one would be a five-year plan if voters approve it, rather than a permanent increase. I think that uh, the city council was, was thinking in terms of being able to assess what has been done uh, over that period of time and also to not ask the voters to carry that heavy of a load uh, for as in terms of a permanent increase. Uh, there need to be other mechanisms and they're looking into that for permanent solutions to fixing the roads. Um, they did such a great job managing this last five-year plan. Um, so I think that it's it's working really well and another five years is definitely in order. And David, you've said that the city should turn to its existing budget rather than approving an increase here. So what, where would they, should they find the money in the budget today if they say they don't have enough money? Well, uh, there is uh, a, a, a quite a bit of room in the budget, we feel, for uh, finding the money. There's $58 million in other services uh, in the budget that are unexplained. Uh, and we feel that the mayor and council just uh, does not manage the funds that come in uh, on the current tax basis. Uh, they gave uh, bonuses to their city employees at the end of last year because they had money left over. Uh, and now they're coming to the taxpayers and saying, but we can't afford for roads, police and fire, uh, so let's tax ourselves again. And we just, we don't believe in tax and spend. And this is a tax and spend issue. You mentioned the $58 million. What, what is that specifically? Uh, I don't know. Uh, it's, not spe it's not broken out. It's other services. Uh, we know that the city uh, spends money on uh, uh, granting funds to nonprofits, uh, neighborhood associations. Uh, these are things that are not essential fu functions of government. These are things that, that are, uh, uh, should come from excess funds or other sources. Uh, I have a 40-year uh, experience in managing nonprofits, 
and, and I don't think it's appropriate. Uh, for the city to be giving money away to nonprofits and then coming to the taxpayers and saying we can't afford roads, police, and fire. Besides roads and police and fire and parks and garbage collection, and in the case of Tucson Water, these are the essential services. These aren't something you don't run out of money for uh, when you're spending money on other things that are not essential services. And Joe, do you care to respond to that? Well, I believe that it, it's it, these are ve very essential services, but what we're looking at here is we're looking at really the failure of the state legislative majority to, uh, to properly fund not just Tucson, the cities and towns in Arizona, uh, uh, particularly for uh, road repair. So the amount of money that we're talking about for road repair is significant here. There are two categories of road repair. And we have so many roads that are actually failing now at this point where, uh, you know, this, this is a, it's a much better investment to keep them in good shape. It's a good point to make that um, there is no disagreement that, say, the roads are in bad shape. Everybody agrees the roads need to be fixed. This question is how to pay for it. That's right. And, and I couldn't agree with, with Jo Moore and what she's saying about roads. Uh, I just think it's inappropriate. Uh, and the party ha has gone on record as it's being that it's inappropriate. To, to go to the taxpayers for a ta uh, sales tax increase to pay for it. Uh, find other money in the budget to cut to pay for these essential programs of government. So one of the, the points that she brought up is the state funding mm -hmm. of roads. The roads hurt. specifically, it's not, we're not having the same conversation about police and fire. Mm -hmm. But the state has been pulling away road money from cities and towns mm -hmm. for years and using it on other state services, which means the city of Tucson is left then with less money for roads. So how does that factor into your argument that they're, they're, they should just have the money? Well, I, yes, the, that has caused a budget problem. But solve the budget problem. Don't go to the taxpayers and say, we need you to pony up some more. Uh, and uh, I, again, I'll make the same point. Uh, there are, there's fat in the city budget uh, and uh, that needs to be cut and cut that fat and uh, don't go to the taxpayers. Uh, and I couldn't agree with Joe Moore uh, about the state of our roads and the police and fire uh, need to be supported. But city of Tucson, mayor council, Support them. Joe, you mentioned other mechanisms, more permanent mechanisms. I mean, what would you suggest is the alternative um, that the city could be looking for instead of these temporary measures? I don't have specifics on those alternatives, but I do. what I do know is that the city is, in fact, looking at specific, uh, I think that's pretty detailed, it's pretty wonky, uh, specific mechanisms for uh, uh, for guaranteeing, really. I think it's important that it is sustainable. I mean, this gets back to your initial question, is that are we going to do this every five years, or are we going to have longer-term plans for maintaining roads? Since we're apparently on our own here, we're not going to get the assistance from the state that we uh, should be getting, and we won't be getting assistance from the federal government, more than likely. So uh, it's up to us. It's up to us to plan for the longer term. Um, but right now, it's important to support the city with, with basically with the emergency vehicles and with better roads. So you're saying this is the option we have on the table, so that's why the party It's the voters' it. choice, really. It's up to the voters, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So uh, this, is, this is their choice. This is the question that's being asked. Do you want to pay uh, a half-cent sales tax? To, to make this a reality, and that supports everything in the city. Now, in a guest editorial to the Arizona Daily Star, you, David, wrote that this will increase the cost of living in Tucson mm -hmm. and also have, obviously, an impact on the lowest income residents of the city. Is that a concern of the Democratic parties in this? Yes, it is always a concern if we have to raise taxes, believe it or not. Democrats do not like to raise taxes. Uh, the thing is, is that your vehicle gets damaged by bad roads. Um, I don't even want to talk about what would happen if we don't have the emergency equipment to respond to, uh, to emergencies, essentially. Those are costs, too. Those are costs that are borne by our society, by the whole community. You might not actually be able to put one particular monetary value on those costs, but I think it would be much, much greater than the half-cent sales tax.
And David, I want to yeah. ask you, we've talked a little bit about finding a permanent solution. Why not take the, the risk on the short-term solution that's being presented here? Uh, some would say it's a low risk because it's only five years. Why not? Well, I'd like to, before I answer that question, uh, respond to your, your reference to the article in the, in the paper that I wrote. Uh, it's the, it, you're actually, and you're talking about the regressive nature of a sales tax. Uh, it, it, it impacts the poor more than it does the rich, uh, or the well-to-do, or the, proportionally. Uh, I mean, a, a, a half-cent sales tax uh, increase on uh, someone with a good job, uh, and uh, uh, well off uh, is not going to affect them much. But the, the, Tucson is the fifth poorest city in the United States of, of large cities. Uh, people that live in the city center and will be paying this sales tax are going to be more affected. Uh, it's, it, that's why we're against, one of the many reasons we're against it. Now, um, your question was on? On uh, short term, the fact that this is a, such a short term pr uh, proposal, so right. why not sort well, of take that maybe lower risk chance? Well, we are not quite confident that the city won't come back at the end of five years and say, well, we've gotten used to this, uh, so pass another one. And when I was listening to Joe talk about a, a long term solution, sounds like another tax increase. Uh, I mean, it, it, that's what it sounds like you're talking about, and the, and the mayor and council are considering, considering is some sort of long-term tax solution uh, to this problem of what we believe is poor budget uh, control. Ballots are due back to the city by 7 p.m. May 16th. Then the ballots will be counted. Christopher Conover joined me to discuss the security of ballot counting and voter registration. Statewide, the numbers have dropped. Pima County is no different, but that's perfectly normal because the counties, Pima included, go through and clean out those voter rolls from time to time. They look for people who haven't voted in years and they move them to an inactive role. If someone has died, they're not on the rolls anymore. If someone has moved, they're taken off the rolls and that type of thing. So a drop after a large election is not uncommon because you have a big bump coming into an election and it's just the natural way of life. People move into town, out of town, or whatever, uh, so the numbers drop. It's perfectly normal. Looking at the overall numbers, we have 206,000 Democrats in Pima County, 164,000 Republicans, and 167,000 independents or no party voters for a total of about 544,000 voters. Anybody doing the math at home know those numbers don't add up perfectly because we also have Greens and Libertarians and some other smaller parties in there. But the overall feel, if you will, of the electorate in Pima County hasn't changed uh, the numbers, even though the numbers have dropped. And then how often do they go through, you mentioned the cleaning of the rolls, how often does that happen? Is it after every presidential election or after every election? The Pima County actually keeps a pretty close eye on it. Uh, I talked with Chris Rhodes, who's Pima County's registrar of voters, so he's responsible for the voter rolls. Uh, and they go through fairly often. For example, they watch the obituaries in the newspapers, and if someone has died, they take them off the rolls. They don't wait for the official death notification from the state. So those roles, that part of the role gets cleaned fairly often. We are heading into the city election. Ballots are out now and people will be sending them back. And so I want to have you talk a little bit about the reporting you've done about election fraud. Um, so what does Pima County and the state of Arizona do to prevent any problems with the voting as those ballots are getting mailed back? Both the county and the state do lots of things. Some of it is duplicative, uh, so it gets run through the county and the state and some each group handles on their own, if you will. Let's start with mail-in balloting since this election is all mail-in. First thing they do, as we just talked about, is they clean the voter rolls. Now, we always hear accusations, especially places like Chicago or Florida, where I'm from, of dead people voting. It doesn't happen. Again, when I was talking to Chris Rhodes about this, he said the reason it doesn't happen is because they clean it now. It is possible that if someone dies after ballots are mailed out as they were this week, the ballot still goes out. So a ballot could be mailed to someone who is no longer with us, but 
it is very, very rare that they get voted. He said there was one case where a, a son did vote his father's ballot after his father had died. And the county went after him to prosecute him, or they at least started questioning him. And he said, look, I knew how dad wanted to vote. I voted how dad wanted to vote. By the way, I disagreed with my father on how he wow, wanted to vote. but he still voted. But he still voted, and he signed his own name instead of his father's name on the mail-in ballot. So he got caught. And that's the way people do get caught, is the signatures. If I sign my mail-in ballot or you sign your mail-in ballot and, and your signature doesn't look right, two people have to check it, first of all, at the county. And if it doesn't look right, they don't agree, they call you. That's why we have to put our phone numbers on there. And they say, Andrea, did you actually vote your ballot? The people who check those are trained every two years by a forensic handwriting analyst. So those aren't just volunteers who wander in for a couple hour shifts. All the people who do that checking for Pima County are trained, and that training is renewed every two years. And the reality is all of our signatures change over time, and they expect that. That's why they call. And usually, nine times out of ten, probably even more than that, it's just a case of my signature has changed, or I'm right-handed and I broke my right hand and I was trying to sign it with a cast or I tried to sign it with my left hand and it just didn't look right. But not always. Sometimes somebody votes a ballot, maybe a caretaker votes a ballot for somebody and they forge the signature. Well, that gets caught and dealt with. If it needs to be prosecuted, it can be prosecuted. Most of the time it's not though, but it is at least caught and checked on and the ballot is not counted then, so the vote never happened. So how does that differ from the conversation that we heard a lot of in November, after November, before November, about illegal voting, people who essentially aren't registered to vote, going in and actually casting a ballot? The one we heard very often, of course, was the busloads of people who are in the country illegally showing up at a polling place to vote. Uh, again, Chris Rhodes, said he doesn't think that could actually happen this day and age, very simply because we all have smartphones. He said, think about this, there are six television shows that deal with Bigfoot, and they all have video of Bigfoot. We hear all these accusations, there's not a single picture or a single video anywhere in the country of busloads of people coming to vote illegally. Not to mention, when you go to the poll, when I go to the poll, when our viewers go to the poll, they, there's a book, now it's a tablet, but there's a list of everybody who is registered to vote in that precinct. You have to sign that, you have to show ID, again, the signatures need to match. So if you're not on that roll, they'll give you a provisional ballot that you can vote and it is then set aside and after all the counting is finished, they go back and look at the provisional ballots and they start making phone calls. Why did you insist on voting in that precinct. Maybe it was a problem on their end. Maybe you should have voted in that precinct and they let you go ahead and, and have that ballot counted. But maybe you shouldn't have voted in that precinct. Maybe you're not eligible to vote for any number of reasons, but you insisted on voting. Your ballot does not count. And each one of those provisional ballots is checked by someone. Follow updates about the election on our website, news.azpm.org. And of course, we'll post results on election night, May 16th, after 8 p.m. Next, we'll turn away from politics. Pima County is restoring its iconic downtown courthouse and preparing it for use as a visitor center. The building once housed all offices of county government, not just courts. The jail was there, along with the health department, administration, and other departments that remained long after. During restoration, workers have found new evidence of how the building changed from its early days in the 1920s through a renovation in the 1950s to now. County Facilities Director Lisa Josker takes us on a tour of the historic site, pointing out the quirks along the way. I like the, the cornice, the new one. In this room, we discovered, when we started peeling away the layers, we discovered that there were architectural features were missing from the structure itself. Behind me, there's a corbel in white where we had to, that had completely fallen off at some point over the years, so we replicated the one on the other side and it's white now because we're patching it in. We found that in a number of instances when we started pulling things away, pulling drywall, pulling paint and, and things, we, we noticed features like that have fallen off. So we replicate them as we go. 
We're in the first floor of the original courthouse. The ceilings are 15 feet high from, from floor to floor, huge cavernous space. We envision this space to be the new visitor center. This is where people will come, the public will come in and they'll be able to see uh, what Tucson is all about, our history, the present, the past, the future. We envision a huge auditorium, the ability to be able to have large groups of people come in. When the contractor came in and we started peeling away the, the ceiling and the, and the systems and everything, we found that there was miles and miles of pipe and electrical wiring and all kinds of things. All of that you can see has been removed. The contractor, when they removed it, they recycled everything. This continues a tradition for, the, for this building because we found on the second floor and third floor that some of the, the joists, some of the, the wood that was used in the ceilings were actually boards used to form some of these walls on the exterior. The tradition of this, this building has been to reuse, recycle, and create new. Let me show you some of the things that we've discovered, especially in terms of the paint colors. So when you come through here, you can see the, the paint up here is what we believe is the original blue color. It's like a periwinkle blue. Um, over the years, it's been painted a lighter color and also a darker color. When we did some looking at the vaults and trying to patch up cracks and everything, we discovered is we peeled through the layers, we, we discovered this, this blue color, which we think is beautiful because it reflects the blue sky, the Tucson blue skies, of course. And here we see a blue color, which is different than the one I was showing you. It's, this is a darker blue, which we believe was done in the 1950s when the addition was put on uh, to the south. Also, you'll see some lines on the ceiling and also across the wall here where the uh, drop ceiling was put in at some point and all of this was hidden. So it was, as we again peeled away the layers of the building, the layers of the onion, we've just, we keep discovering things and we keep seeing what the original fabric of the building was and it's, it's fantastic to be able to see that. We are in what's called courtroom eight or what we call the Dillinger courtroom. In January 1934, Dillinger and his gang were arraigned in this room, this very room. The details that you see in this room, the arched ceiling, the vaulted ceiling, the decorative details, the wood, the, the grill behind me for the, where the radiator, the heating came from, it's all original. All the woodwork is original in this room. What isn't original is there's a wall beyond, you can't see it, but there's a wall beyond here that we cut off. Uh, at some point, this room was cut off and we are going to move that wall away and we're gonna take all the original woodwork so that this room becomes the expansive room that it, that it originally was designed to be. And you'll be able to see, as a member of the public that will be able to come in and as visitors be able to come in and see this room and see it big piece of history of Tucson's history. And um, we think it's phenomenal that all of the original woodwork is here. And this room has been used for a courtroom until just about a year and a half or two years ago when we moved everybody to the, um, the new public service building. So this has been a working room since the day this, this building was built and fully occupied. We are now in the dome. This is the highest place that you can go in the historic courthouse. It is covered right now with the scaffolding, so we can't see the top of the dome, but the dome actually curves. And we are doing some reinforcing work at the top of the dome so that we can make sure that it's waterproof and structurally sound. So one of the things that we're doing, which you're aware of, is we're replacing some of the broken tiles. We have a local tile works, a small business, Santa Teresa Tile Works. Down here, we've got a couple examples of some tiles that they've done. They've done a lot of chemical, looked at the chemistry of the different tiles and the colors and how they faded over the years so that they're able to replicate the tiles that you see now. So when this is installed, and we've started to install and replace the broken tiles with some of these new ones. When you see them up there, you will not see a difference between the old and the new. But now the dome itself will be structurally sound and then the exterior will, will be weatherproofed once again with 
good, solid tiles whose colors match. The project is paid for with $4.5 million in voter-approved borrowing. The other $7 million came from the county's annual budget. That's it for us. Thanks for watching.